Some of you may know what I do, we do. I mean, when I say I, there's really a really large group of us. There's about 35 people in the company. And with that, there is also an extended family. And we do some pretty crazy stuff. Some people think that I make furniture, which we do. Um, and some people think that we're very green and we recycle things, which we do. Um, but what we really do is we kind of mess with your head uh, in a good way. <laughs> Which is kind of nice to be here because it seems that's happening in Detroit in a wonderful way. So the idea of reusing something, reclaiming something, reviving something, it's always been a part of my life. And for the, about 30 years, I've had a construction company in New York City. All we really did was renew, revive, restore buildings. Um, in New York, it's a built city. Everything is essentially already infrastructure. And you're going in and you're, you're reclaiming a building for new usage. And so that's become a way of life that has been always with me. Um, I didn't realize that that's actually a way of life. It's a way of life for all of us, especially now in this time on this planet, because we live on a planet that I think has a lot of old thought patterns which have manifested as physical patterns, structures, buildings, politics, whatever. And really what we're doing is we are reclaiming or reusing all of that at a different level. Um, and uh, I've only been here since Wednesday night, and a little bit that I've seen has blown my mind in terms of what's going on here in Detroit. You guys are extremely fortunate. Uh, I don't know what the, the inner wrap is in terms of whether it's good or bad to live here, but from an outsider's point of view, it's mind-boggling. And there's a lot of buildings to write here too, which is cool. <laughs> so um, what I wanted to try to do was explain the philosophy or the ideas or the invisible mantras behind what makes what we do interesting. And I think what makes it viable. And the only way that I could really come up with that is rather than to talk about uh, what we do and show you pictures of furniture or things like that, I think it's more of a fairy tale, really. And like any good fairy tale, it has adventure, it has mystery, and it's kind of a passion play. And it's also a story that anyone could have their version of in their own life. Um, so there are characters to this fairy tale. Um, one character is a 300-year-old wizard. Another character is a dream, uh, a dream of meanings. Uh, there's a secret map, you gotta have a secret map. Uh, it's on recycled paper <laughs> because it was done at a restaurant after too many glasses of wine. Um, there's a land of enchantment, and there's a magic wand, and there's a few other things. So without further ado, what are these things? Okay, um, this is a really cool picture of upstate New York, and that is where we have our factory, our atelier whatever you want to call it, where we make everything. It's a 950-acre farm up there. It's a very cool place, and it's also an operating farm. And I bought that farm, and at one point, uh, it had a beautiful tree in the front yard. It was a gorgeous 300-year-old maple, and soon after I bought it, it was con condemned. And so it had to be cut down, and I, I really had a hard time with that. I couldn't believe that this beautiful house with this beautiful tree right in front of it was going to now be a beautiful house with no beautiful tree. And I couldn't get my head around how to handle that. And I realized that there's this 300-year-old tree that has seen everybody come and go in front of this house, which has been around for 150 years. And something made me have to deal with this, this 300-year-old wizard. So we cut it down and lay out in the field for a number of years. And I just didn't know how to, how to process that. Um, and then, about that same time, and this was 2003, I started having these dreams. And these dreams were extraordinary, abstract, platonic, solid dreams. And this is sort of the napkin, and it shows 
what was going on in my brain that I had to get up and write for anything. Um, I was having cylinders unfold and unroll and, and basically explain themselves in different ways. And, and slowly they started to communicate to me that this was, you know, these cylinders were trees. And trees grow in linear time. They grow vertically. Then they also grow radially. You know, the rings of a tree. They grow out that way. They grow out spherically. And so the tree was this incredible uh, symbol. And not like what we're used to. We got a tree and you have the roots and we all see that thing. But all of a sudden it was really an abstraction. It was an abstraction of a lot of power and a lot of energy. Um, and that got me thinking about time. Where do we find ourselves in all of this? You know, what's with all this? How does this all fall together? And one thing led to another, and I went out and bought a sawmill, and I cut out that tree. <laughs> and that sawmill was the magic wand, just so you know. The secret map scene. The land of enchantment, we'll see another picture of that. That's the farm upstate. And the dream of meanings was the dream that explained, to me at least, in some some odd abstract language, which I think is where we really live. I do think we live outside of our bodies, outside of time and space, or inside our bodies, um, in a world of pure, pure ideas, you know. Um, and I think part of our task here as individuals and humans on Earth is to take this idea that is me, you, whatever, you're, whatever you are behind the behind the behind, and bring that into manifestation with relationship to the physical world. It's your and my job to manifest this abstraction into being, you know. Um, you can talk about it very weirdly like that, very philosophically, or you can just say, we cut down trees and we make beautiful things. Um, people started calling me, I don't know how they got my name, and they were saying, I have a tree, it's in California, we have to take it down, we're building our house, we can help us. So we started taking trees down all over. Um, this is a flatbed with one giant rock on it that came from California. And this is one of many acquisitions, shall I call it, that sort of came our way. And we started bringing these things around to the farm and cutting them into beautiful things. This is part of the land of enchantment. That's our factory down there. And if you see those big hoop buildings, we dry all our wood and we store it in there. And there's millions and millions of beautiful pieces of wood. Um, and this is sort of a day at the factory. It all starts outside. We have maples, walnuts, elms, mulberries, pieces, things that, species that you don't even see anymore because our relationship to wood, other than recycled stuff like I'm seeing here, which is cool, um, we don't even see wood anymore. Everything's veneered. Uh, and to veneer a piece of wood means you need a particular kind of tree. It can't have any wowies owies, any curves, any. It can't be bigger than three feet in diameter. It just, it's so limited what goes through the industrial process of wood. And who are all the poor orphans that are left on the side? There are millions upon millions upon millions of trees that. They just don't make it. And sometimes those trees are four feet in diameter, five feet in diameter. They're huge. They're incredible. Um, but they're not going to get put in a sawmill. You know, they have nails in them because they were in somebody's front yard. They have rot in the center. We love rot. Well, it's good. <laughs> so we started gathering and gathering and cutting and making things. And we started making furniture and other things out of it. Um, this was, again, 2003, 2004. 2005. This is our sawmill, one of many. That's a small tree. Um, that's actually called a bastard spruce, and uh, that came to us all the way from Oregon. And those are my guys slabbing it out into slabs. Um, if you'll notice, they're not cutting really thick slabs, they're cutting really thin slabs, which is something we sort of originated, and we'll get back to that in a little while. So we have now all the pieces of the story. Um, we're re claiming our relationship with the world around us, the trees, the people who have trees, the process of working with these materials. You know, whenever you find something that you want to do in your life, you're going to have to write the book for yourself. You're, you're going to have to tool up with whatever tools you need 
to make your version of your story work. Um, and in a world where we're kind of homogenized and we all tend to use computers, we all tend to use some similar tools, let's be realistic. Those are just bridge tools to get you into doing what you're doing. And then after that, there's a whole array of what you're going to be needing to deal with the physical world. Virtual reality is one thing, but traction with reality is another thing. And we have a lot of traction with reality. So this is inside one of those buildings. We have incredible, incredible number of logs, slabs. Um, they're all digital photographs. They're all archives. And we can put them on search engine and use the computer and go find a 14-foot black walnut with a crotch at the end that has you know, three-foot taper. Um, really fun stuff. And this kind of set the stage, you know? I mean, everything that we do requires preparation. This was the preparation that set the stage for even having these materials, reusing these materials, reclaiming them, taking them out of the ultimate destination of landfill or uh, firewood, and using them. So two years later, this is a picture of the American, the, the World's Fair in Edo, Japan, the American Pavilion. And Tom Felicia had uh, curated it and took one of our tables and put it into the World's Fair in year two of the company. We were, we were blown away. We were just like, we don't even know who we are. How does anybody else know who we are? <laughs> um, but there you have it. I mean, it's a gigantic maple. It's got, it's just, you can barely use it as a table. You've got to sit in that funny corner there and have a relationship with it that's uh, extremely different from a square or rectangular piece of wood. So we've done our preparation and we all of a sudden had reality, traction with reality. Things were happening. And I, you know, I, I started to think, well, people were saying, where did this come from? Did you? And then you think back, well, what really is your preparation? You know? And I played it back, and I played it back really far. And I grew up in the Philippines. And when I was a kid, I wanted to make a toy boat. And I went and asked a Filipino friend of mine to make a toy boat with me. And we're stick people. We make things out of sticks. We're thin people. <laughs> Uh, took a machete out, whacked a branch, and basically made a boat out of a, mach out of a chunk of wood with a machete. That was a real eye-opener, you know, just what is your relationship to making? What is your relationship to things, you know? Um, I went to Yale. Uh, I got an independent study with the dean of the sculpture school because he said, you're too crazy, I can't keep you in class. <laughs> After two years, he said, what are you going to do when you graduate? I said, I'm going to go to graduate school in sculpture. Chris Vaughan. I said, all right. And he said, well, you go to New York and you'll get a sculpture and you'll get a gallery. And I was like, what's wrong with that? And he said, no, 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 no. You should just do what you love to do. We hear that all the time. Just do what you love to do. What does that really mean? You know, that didn't sink in. So years passed, you know, 30 years of running a construction company in New York and trying to pay the rent or make a life happen in those ways. But underneath it, all of the preparations that had happened, all those parts of it, they've all added up to something, they all meant something. Being a contractor for 25 years in Manhattan, I learned every material imaginable and how to micro-engineer things, how to put things together, how to make things not fail, how to deal with clients, how to deal with money, finances, uh, every part of it. So your preparation never, never ends, you know, and your preparation is key to what you want to do. Um, fast forward, we're now making incredibly cool pieces. This is, I call this the Grand Canyon table. We just took two sculpts of pieces of wood that had almost the same shape and put a little toy. We put them together. Um, we also put little bronze ties on them. Incredibly beautiful pieces. These were always becoming in great, great demand. And then, then we started to really try to reclaim our own ideas. I think you can reinvent yourself and redigest your own vision. We found that there were a lot of people starting to take on this, let's make a beautiful live edge wood table. And our culture, which had not seen it since uh, Nakashima, I think, and now we were reviving it and starting to play with it in a really healthy way, as a thing now. We're talking about not the philosophy, but the things. Um, and we went to the ICFF, this furniture fair in New York, and there were slabs of wood everywhere. And a lot of the tables were ugly and <laughs> didn't make sense. And uh, nobody knew where the wood was coming from. They bought their slabs online. Not to be critical, but we didn't see that was how we wanted to play the game. 
And so we started taking the idea of the wood and reclaiming it in a different way, in a, in a very twisted sort of way. This is a cast aluminum table. We took a beautiful slab of wood and we made a mold out of it and we melted aluminum and poured it into the mold and made a cast aluminum wood table. Um, and it's incredible. I mean, you, you smack it and it goes boing, boing, boing. It's metal. Um, and our mold is 22 feet long, so we could dam it anywhere and make a long, shorter, whatever version of it. It was truly, truly incredible. So now we're getting something for nothing. We made a brick club chair. Uh, and a friend met an art gallery. And she said, I'm doing a show. I need bricks to make a brick wall. Can you help me get bricks to make a brick wall? I help you get the bricks. We had the show, and then a few months later, I got a phone call saying, come get your bricks. And I was like, those aren't my bricks, those are your bricks. <laughs> I don't want them. And I was going to complain, and I said, no, 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 this is cool. Let's go get the bricks. So we got the bricks, we brought them down to the shop, and we said, let's make a brick club share. Um, it has one, one wood brick, because we do things in wood. Um, and I signed my name there, because you have to sign this stuff, because you're an artist, you know. Um, but it's really micro-engineered and it's very cool and it has a plywood box underneath it so you can actually pick it up and move it. It's been on the road, it's traveled, and it sits very comfortably and it's a brick clutch here. And then we took a restored piece of, uh, a recycled piece of heart pine, which is an amazing wood. Um, it's an American wood that was almost all milled out and logged out at the turn of the century and went into all the cities that we have these big, beautiful brick buildings with wood framing. It's all heart pine. It's an amazing wood. Um, what did we do with it? We stuck it under an exquisitely made bronze chaise lounge. Um, again, irony, wit, playfulness, extreme relationship with incredibly beautiful materials, um, soft against hard, man-made against organic, and you're elevating each one of these things by putting them together, letting them play together. This was kind of a devious move. We were basically saying, we're not just reclaiming trees, we're not just making things out of trees. We're trying to reclaim our relationship with design, our relationship with what we make and how we make it and how we see things. Um, so we called it the retaliation collection. <laughs> but that was kind of an in-house thing. This suddenly became one of the coolest pieces I ever made. This is the beaver table. Um, and I have a pond with a beaver dam there and they keep building their dam and I keep tearing it down because they go chop all the trees down. And this has gone on for years and one day I was cleaning up the beaver dam and I looked at these pieces of wood and they were these beautiful branches and like in the cartoons when the beaver cuts the tree down it's got the little pointy thing and it goes boom. These pieces all had these little pointy things and little two teeth marks all up and down them. They were the most beautiful little pieces of what I ever saw in my life. So took a piece of glass and drilled holes in it, took the sticks apart, put them back together again, and made the beaver table. So now we're really getting crazy. Now we're, we're reusing beaver hand sticks. Um, these pieces started to get really recognized too now as sculptural pieces. And we started to blow it up, make it bigger, get architectural. Um, you saw those guys milling that giant log into what we call micro slabs. We, we invented this process called microsliding, and we have really thin pieces of wood. But they have all the information and all the knowledge and all the, all the education that uh, a thick piece of wood would have. And you can weave them, you can play with them. We use them, uh, in this case, as screens. Uh, we put them on recycled timbers. That one actually has been colored in graphite from a big giant pencil. And uh, we've wrapped them around glass boxes. Um, we've tried to, again, take the story that nature's telling us and play with it and use it and bring it back into your world in a way that is really different, really unique, really unexpected. And if you go back to that drawing of cutting through the cylinder in different ways, intervening, you're cutting through time, you know. Uh, you're really intervening in a very philosophical way with your materials. and. You know, we kind of do that as people. We intervene and we cut through time. We start doing really huge architectural pieces. This is Nobu, a restaurant in New York City. It's got a giant, giant black walnut slab bar. It's got onyx. It has recycled cherry planks going up and down it, timbers and everything. Um, and at this point, 
the, the vision is starting to get huge. Um, yeah, it's really quite something. This, uh, this is a, you know, whenever you take a piece of a log and you cut it, you get all these planks, but they have live edge on the side of the planks. And we, uh, we thought, well, you know, if you make those into planks, you have all this leftover wood. What do we do with that? And so we've seen stack walls where either stone or little pieces of wood that are usually milled straight. We reused live edge pieces of wood and made a stack wall that's really immense. And uh, it became, a, you know, a giant sculpture. Uh, this is what happens when we go out and try and bring trees back home. <laughs> they get cut down, they get hung up, people have to like do stupid things and risk their lives, but this was thrown in the slideshow for yucks. So. <laughs> this was another tree that was dead in Oregon, and some say it was you know, one of the world's largest black walnut trees. We needed a 600 ton crane to uh, take this thing. Um, and you know, it's funny, it brings up a, a whole bunch of stories where people come to me and they'll go, this is really beautiful, and they go, well, wait a minute, wait, you cut down a 300 year old tree. It's like, no, 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 you don't understand, it was dead, you know? Or a 300 year old tree with a 300 year old life expectancy is not gonna become a 600 year old tree. It, uh, you have to look at these things different. This will be dirt one day. It will go into the forest floor and be dirt. And try and look at it differently. Try and look at it as if you have a, a grandfather or a grandmother, and instead of putting them out to pasture, you're going to bring them into your home and let them tell you stories for the rest of your life. Um, but it's a funny thing because people have a, a, a weird notion of what does it mean to be green? You know, what are the rules of this game? You know, um, in this case, this tree was dead, and it was an incredible production to get it down and we are using it for some amazing things. From a huge, huge tree, these are micro slabs. Now, that would be a, probably an 800 to 1,000 pound piece of wood, but if Victor on the right wanted to, he could hold that with a thumb and a forefinger. It's so light, it's so thin. Um, and the micro slab thing that we're starting to play with and have been playing with for a number of years is really cool. It's revealing a lot of things. These are slabs from that giant tree. Um, this is the best set. They're a matched book match set. Uh, they're eight feet long by ten feet long, and we were going to make them into. All we could think of was, you know, we need to find a, a head of state or a king somewhere and have a giant table at it. Yeah. But we could, um, and so we have a project now where we're going to actually put them on the wall as an art piece because they're just too cool in a big public space as in a lobby. Um, there, there's something else. Those micro slabs that we were cutting there, we were working with the Rockwell group and they wanted to make them into curved slabs. Nobody had ever curved a piece of wood like that ever before. So we had played around with it and done some technical things and figured out how to curve and bend. And we created the historical display area at Mohegan Sun uh, out of these slabs, and they're, they're real wood. There's nothing fake about this. There's no fiberglass involved. These are, you walk up to them and touch them and feel them, and they're real wood slabs. Um, and then again, technically unheard of, just, just unheard of, you know. And perhaps one of the funniest things we got involved in was <laughs> somebody uh, had done a <coughs> program called Suka 2010 in uh, Union Square in New York. And, we worked together with them. The vision was to have a log floating on a pane of glass. And we did the engineering and realized that the log would have weighed 18,000 pounds. So we took all the parts of a log and we took a lot of curved plywood and we took the log apart and we put it back together again. And that's a hollow log. Um, and no one knew the difference. And people were coming around and they were looking at it. And guys were telling their girlfriends, yeah, that's an oak. I like that. You know, I'm really, I know I would. So that's an oak. No, it's not real. But uh, it was real fun. It was really good. But all of this really comes down to, you know, how does this, in a sense, okay, we reclaim some wood, big deal. But that's really not what happened along the way. The process was about reclaiming and reusing materials from nature, reclaiming and reusing your relationship um, with materials. In order to do this work and do what we do, 
you get involved at all these different levels. I've got to go in the woods with people who have two teeth. And then I've got to also sit in rooms with clients and architects. Uh, you know, this is a wonderful way to, it's a great equalizer, you know. We tend to be, as I said, very homogenous in life. And when your passion takes you to something that requires you to get out of your comfort zone, to get out there and do something, you know, you you have to allow yourself the humility and the growth and the evolvement of yourself to realize that my picture of myself is very limited. And the more I'm pushed to do things like this, the more it, you just love it. You know, you love as a person becoming broader, wider, higher, and and ultimately it's. It's about relationships. It's about relationships between things, relationships between people. And I've often, often wondered, you know, as we go through our lives, we so much tend to think of myself and that thing, myself and that person. And I never, never really until, you know, enough involvement took place to see that it's not about that as much as it's about the space between me and that thing and the space between me and that person and the affection between me and anything out there. And the more affection you bring to anything you do, the more unstoppable you are and the more human you become. And uh, I think probably that's the part of it that's really starting to blossom now as we go into our 10th year, is that whole idea of it's, it's about the relationship, it's about the affection, it's about traction with reality, love of all the parts of it and, uh, you know, sometimes I wonder, you know, in an atom you've got the nucleus and the electron, and we think it just goes around and there's endless space in between that. And, you know, how much affection is there between the nucleus of an atom and the electron that it holds it there and it keeps it there? From one point of view, it's physics, but from another point of view, it's kind of a love story. I mean, they're not letting go, you know. The solar system, the same story. And we kind of recapitulate all of this, if I can, and I can, I can, make that a part of my life and get that into my life when I've got my story and it actually means enough to me and you'll have your story. And it took, for me, I'm 58, it took me a really long time to come to the point of doing this and really, really loving what's coming out of it. We just started a new company called Soundwall right about the time that, you know, crystallization took place. Um, we suddenly realized there's no sonic architecture out there and now we just started a new company which uh, employees sound. I'm a musician also. Uh, and we just had our first exposition, and we're now creating a whole nother iteration of projects and pieces and works that, uh, that use music and sound. Uh, architecture should be seen as well as heard, and uh, who knows where that one's going to go. So we've got another 10 years going into, into that iteration of what we do. So that's pretty much it. Thanks for having me. Five to ten minutes and do some Q and A. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for John? Sure. Where's the installation that you say for the floating log? That <laughs> you would have to ask that. That was a it was a forty eight hour installation, and it's another example of pure civic bungled stupidity. They did it in Union Square for forty eight hours, and they were going to auction. There were fourteen of these pieces, all different. They were going to auction them off, and that was the big deal, and they had a big party, and the terms of the auction were if you wanted to buy something, you actually had to get it off Union Square within four hours. Now, I didn't show up with my crane. I don't know if you showed up with your crane. <laughs> Nobody showed up with a crane, and all that stuff went in, in a garbage can, in a dumpster. That's the difference between, you know, right thinking and wrong thinking. You know, you had a great show in a garbage can. Yes? Um, what did you do with the space uh, in your landscape where you lost your tree? There's a stump there with a bird feeder on it. <laughs> Not everything is special. <laughs> <laughs> the stump is rotting, and I think the bird feeder is rotting too. <laughs> that's another, that's funny too because we have 950 acres. It's bigger than Central Park. Uh, it's a working farm. We sell trailer loads of hay all over the country. It's a scale of operation that is so big that 
you'll have affectionate moments with things and you'll move on. You'll go do something else or build another barn or build another building or build another shop or something. And then you'll come back, like you just said, and go, oh my God, there's that stump that's been there for 15 years. Like, what am I doing with that? But, you know, that's life. Sure. Yeah. Uh, can you shed some light kind of on what your process is like, how your team kind of comes together and decides what you're going to create, what you're going to design, where you guys find inspiration? It's a very irrational and a very rational story. Uh, the irrational part is me, and the rational part is everybody else. <laughs> and I'm really sort of, somebody asked me yesterday, how do you do what you do? And it, it's, I'm very apologetic about it. Um, I'm, I'm just intuitive. I don't like to spend a lot of time doing anything. Uh, and so what usually happens is I just get an idea, and I sketch it, and I give it to the team. And a lot of times they'll draft it into CAD and you know basically extrapolate and make it become, and it goes into a purchase order, it goes into the shop, and becomes part of the process. Um, other times people in the company will weigh in, they'll go, I think, you know, you kind of took a left turn here, you might want to take a right, or have you considered this? Um, and so there is a process, um, but because we tend to make all our own stuff, a lot of people have very different disciplines. You design, you give it to somebody else, they make it. We hold the entire field from, from the tree or the stone out of the quarry all the way to somebody's lobby somewhere. Um, and that makes it really, really different where I depend so much on my team to make things and the actual designing or the you know, moment of inspiration is really kind of an idiot smart thing that I do. Um, and I, I do it in music too. As a musician, I don't like to study a score and learn how to play that score. I'd like to do a Keith Jarrett thing where I auto extemporize and just improvise what sounds like a written piece. Um, I, I don't think we really need to be hindered so much by time and process. I really think as, as human beings, our birthright is to be extremely visionary. and come up with something in the flash. Uh, and then the question is, either you or your team has to now make that into something. Um, but I'm not, I can't belabor a design. I just can't, you know. You would ask that question. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, how many people do you employ? And when your time comes, what is your exit strategy for the There's no exit strategy. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Um, <coughs> well, see, that's another really important philosophical question. You know, I don't know if you know anything about Sufism. It's an esoteric not religion, but it's an esoteric way of thinking, and it's been around for thousands of years. Uh, and in a Sufi tradition or an esoteric school, if you have a teacher and the teacher dies, you close the school. That's not how we do it in the West. If the teacher dies, you make a big corporation, you try and keep moving that product you know, as long as you can. Um, what I would do personally, this is just one of a number of things that I've done over my life, and it's kind of gotten to a comfort zone that I like and that I don't have to really, really, you know, jump out of my skin to get these things done. Um, we have a great team, there's 28 people at the shop and there's six or seven people in New York City. Um, I have incredibly good people, uh, took a long time to get, and they're bringing up the level through computer interaction. You couldn't even have done this business 15 years ago without the internet. We send digital drawings and we mark them up and we, you know, everything is done. We're in a rural area that is so, so tiny. The nearest gas station is seven miles away. I go 30 miles, three miles to go get groceries. And then I go to Manhattan every week for, you know, a day and a half. As far as exit strategy, I would personally just like to keep opening up the envelope, bending the envelope, and coming up with new explorations out of this. Um, but I would never, I could never stop working. I mean, that this would be is, different. I just wondered if you had any plan to pass this on to somebody else. I have a two-year-old daughter. She's dying to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> she's been making things since she was six months old. No, no, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I really don't. And. Uh, you know, in down economic times, I thought, God, can we just sell the company, you know, cash out and move on? And then once the recession was over and we started moving again, I was like, no, don't touch that. That's my child, you know. So, I don't know, really it's, it's, it's a labor of love amidst 
a life of a lot of labor, and I don't know where it's going to wind up. So the not knowing is really good, you know. Yes. I was curious, um, do you go out and look for those trees that you work with, or are those always uh, somebody sending you saying, hey, I have this tree, can you come look at it? And then do you limit, does it have to be a certain size for you to go get one of the dead trees or, or dying trees? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there is no preconcession, none whatsoever. Um, People call us and say, I've got a giant tree. We go to take it down. I've actually paid like $5,000 to somebody would call me from Maryland. I go to Maryland and they have a beautiful tree and they go, we want to take it off the property. And it's going to take $5,000 to take it down. I put $5,000 more dollars in their pocket. We've cut the tree down and it's totally hollow inside. Uh, it got hit by lightning. Nobody said that. We have a giant donut factory. And, you know, most people, including the loggers that I work with, they're like, oh, no, what do you do now? And we just take it. And here's a great story. So we took a number of those trees and cut them into giant donuts, you know, just to get the feel of the abstract shapes that they were creating and where the trees sprocketed out and everything. And we had architects come up all the time. They look at things and they love them. Um, and we got a commission from the King of Morocco to make, you know, a giant coffee table and where that hollow tree split off we turn that into a massive multi-potted coffee table that's absolutely beautiful and you know from one end to the other it's about eight feet long you couldn't preconceive that you got to work with what comes down your way and what's even weirder to really go back to that question because everything is useful you know roots we have a table that was a root we turn it upside down beaver tree beaver table um, what's really incredible is when I get a drawing from an architect who has seen our work and then says, you know, can you make me a table where the tree does that? And like, Have you ever seen a tree that does that? <laughs> it doesn't do that. <laughs> so it's very funny how random, this is a very chaotic world that we live in and that we're, we're dealing with, as a business especially, because everything's custom. And you just, you can't imagine the level of awareness. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way or a negative way. Some people just have no awareness of the physical world or the tree world, and some people are overly acute. So it's always a dance with your clients and your customers and your commissioners um, as to what are you gonna make for them. Uh, and there's a fear factor too. I mean, sometimes I just look at it and I give up, I don't know. What are we doing? We one night of sleep, and you know, the secret dream thing starts up again. So. But I'll take any anything. I will. You just never know. I mean, we use mulberry. It's a beautiful wood. Nobody uses mulberry. Um, there's there's so much out there to play with. Yes, sir. It appears there's a lot of crazy wood and metal people, you know, like the Albert Paley's and the Wendell Castles. And the, um, is that serendipity? Or is there something in the water in upstate New York? <laughs> <laughs> we have really good water. You know, I don't know. I, you know, I think it's funny because when you travel around this country, you just see such different realities. Um, you know, I really like the South. and I, I'm just here two days, but I'm really kind of in love with Detroit. Um, I don't know what your area brings to you that makes you have the affection to do something with it. Um, but I just know that up there, there's not a lot up there. There's dairy farms, and there's trees, and there's rocks. And, you know, work with what you have. Uh, it actually is kind of a mysteriously <laughs> annoying thing that I could have, maybe I love bamboo, bamboo doesn't grow up there. Um, it really is an in situ situation. Um, it helps that I really do love wood. I mean, I've always loved wood and I've always loved trees. Um, and then all of those people you've discussed also, they work with it very differently. Uh, you know, I mean, Wendell Castle, he's like the layer cake king. Um, it's extremely machined. Um, and this is a much more zen-like approach. I kind of hate to use that word, but it's it really is minimal intervention, minimal work. Uh, there's a lot of microengineering in it. There's a lot of things that those giant pieces of wood can explode, they can crack, they can break metal bases. 
Uh, they can do really crazy stuff, so you've got to have a real tactical and technical knowledge about what you're doing. But I just think it's amazing to sort of let it stand in its own right, in its own way. So, yes? Can you chronologically give us uh, like that timetable for the afterlife of that timber? When it's cut, <coughs> um, how long does it sit outside? When do you resaw it? Mm -hmm. um, does it get kiln dried for how long? until it becomes a table? Everything has a different latency of drying time. So, you know, you've got oaks. There's 400 oak species in America. That's just, I mean, it's amazing what you're really dealing with out there. Um, oak is an inch. You dry for a year per inch of thickness. So a three-inch thick slab has to carry dry for three years before you put it in a kiln. Kilns are really expensive. We went and bought shipping containers uh, with that foam insulation that their cooling thing was broken. We got them really cheap, 3,000 bucks. And we went out and bought these dry kiln dryers and put them in, and we designed our own kilns. Um, so those trees and those roots and all those slabs and everything, they're gonna sit in those hoop buildings anywhere from, you know, four weeks to four years. Those big giant slabs that you saw, I've had those air drying for six, seven years now. Um, and then you get projects where they all of a sudden they want to go now. You know, you've got to build this thing, and you're torn. You've got X number of slabs of wood. Um, you really want to air dry them in a year, another year before you put them in a kiln. But you know, the hotel is opening in six months. We've outsourced our drying to microwave kilns, which actually cook them. I would do that. Uh, it doesn't work. Um, but there is the best thing you can do is just cut them and stack them and. My accountants go, what are you doing? You have so much inventory out there. And I explain, it's not ready yet. It's not ready yet. You can't hit me with your accounting you know, point of view. Because the older and the more aged and dry it is, the safer it's going to be to work with it. And it still goes in the kiln because it's got to get 6 to 7% moisture content before you use it. Um, and you got to know where your client is. You know, If you've got a client in the Philippines, that's going to expand when it goes home to their house. If you've got a client in Dubai, it's going to shrink. And we get callbacks. We get ridiculous callbacks. Not a lot, but, you know, you know, you do stuff like this and you have a client in, you know, Mexico City who says, my table is cracking and Luis, get on the plane. <laughs> you got to send people to do it. So again, with that whole issue of how involved are you getting, you're getting really involved. You're getting involved with the, the guy with, you know, the logger in the woods, and you're getting involved with, you know, the politician in Mexico City, and you know everything in between. Uh, and you better like that because it's part of the deal. Yeah. But the drawing is critical. And people, you really have to explain that to them. Anybody else? Well, yes. Yeah. A little while ago, you said that you thought that we were lucky in Detroit. Can you expand on why you think we were lucky? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good question. That's a really great question. I've been here since Wednesday night, um, and this is totally a random litany I'm going to give you right now. First of all, as a builder and as a renovator of buildings, and as some English lady said in Florence many years ago, oh, you're a resuscitator of holy buildings. <laughs> um, you have an amazing, amazing building product inventory out there, and the architecture, you know, I'm. 30 years in New York City, you've got cooler architecture here. I don't care what anybody says. Um, there's some amazing stuff that I've seen in the short time I've been here. We drove around, we went to Cranbrook, we saw everything in between. We walked all around downtown, we looked at a bunch of the, uh, uh, the projects uh, that uh, you guys are building or renovating here. And just from that standpoint alone, I think that's amazing. Okay. From the other standpoint of, for example, seeing what Dan is doing and what Dan and Jennifer have created in terms of a multi-layer cake of businesses and projects and interactivities. Um, New York, you don't de people don't develop buildings and think about the communities. Let's create a community. You know, let's create interactions. Let's bring people here. You know, we're building it and they will come, but let's make sure they come. Let's figure out how to get them here. Let's make sure they can shop and you know go out and do things. New York is so so monetized. It's like it's about the building. Hey, I got a building, or I don't have a building, I'm going to build a building. And I've actually done some developments in Manhattan, and it's just about the building. You know? Here, I see interactivity. I see young people. I see, 
You walk down City Street in New York these days. I went there in 1980 and people were, you know, reading Norman Mailer. Now they're just dragging their sorry asses to work to be able to pay, you know, $3,000 rents. Um, you guys, maybe you're Midwesterners, but you all seem happy. You know? <laughs> um, I, if I wasn't stuck where I am, I'd call my wife yesterday and I said, hey, you know, we should think about moving to Detroit. And she would say, shut up. <laughs> As we say that every time I go somewhere. <laughs> I think you have, you have aesthetics here that are really, really endearing. And you also have a scale that's really cool. I don't know how tall the tallest building here is, 20 stories maybe, something like that. I mean, down over GM, you've got some skyscrapers, but in the downtown area, you're at 10 to 20 stories. That's human scale, you know? We went up in some of the buildings and looked out, and, and it was sort of like, wow, I exist, you know? I've had clients in Manhattan who live on the 80th floor of some building. You don't exist. It's totally theoretical. You can't even hear anything out there. The windows are all shut. Uh, you know, your kids go to private school, $40,000 tuition for a 10-year-old, come on. So, uh, again, this is kind of off the cuff, but <laughs> I think one of the greatest things about this country is that people with ideas getting together and doing something and making their world better. As simple as that, that I see happening here. In New York, I'm sorry, it's just, it's just too much of a monetized situation. And, and I also think, as I've seen, you know, through the 80s into the 90s, I had this mantra where everything used to be about value. What's the value of something in terms of money? And then this secondary economy started to come up through the value economy, and it was the, what can I get away with economy? And I really think that's run, it's run amok. Um, and I, I think you should be able to get up in the morning and, you know, you pay your rent on Saturday, you go have coffee and breakfast, but, you know, there are moments in the day when you get your wallet out, but you can't just keep getting your wallet out all the time. You've got to live a little bit. And that's why I, I just feel that you have a much better shot at having real lives here in a story that I think is very cool and growing than in Manhattan, a rich person's paradise. You know, I can't, I can't do that here. So. And I lived there for a long time, and I owned you know, apartments, and I did that. I just, it's not living. Anybody else? Yes. It is really remarkable when you look back at your life and you see that sometimes in the second half, you're going to do something that leaves an amazing legacy and inspires other people to reach into their creative soul and, and do something remarkable. And I really think that's great. That's yeah, I, I, I had no idea. I mean, like, right. when, when you're 30 and you say, where am I going to be when I'm 58, you usually see that as geographical. I'm going to live here and have my lifestyle will be like this. And, you know, there's a lot of other potentialities there that are very, you just, I mean, I can't, you can't see them when you're a certain age. I would never have known that I'd be doing this. I would have said, oh, this is crazy, this guy's nuts, leave me my phone. Don't become that guy. Or from the standpoint of a business, scaling it up. So how are you going to scale this up? You know, I mean, it's, you know, several million of dollars a year business. Uh, think you can hit 100 million, you know, can you take it to 200 million? No. You know, is there anything wrong with having a meeting small business that's really cool, you have a lot of fun, you spread a lot of good stuff around the world, and you enjoy every minute of it. Um, you know, I've always said, what is your clock? You know, everybody has a different clock. You know, what's your clock? You shouldn't feel compelled that you have to be doing something by a certain age. And what's your size? You know, um, you shouldn't feel that because it's fashionable now to own a business that Scales up, you know. Scales up, scales up, scales up. Well, not everybody wants to scale up, you know. And how big is big? So, you know, everybody's got their own story. Yes, sir. Is everything one of? Do you addition, or do you sell pieces that are permanently in line? If you have a piece that is designed using a live edge piece of wood, even though it's the same design. Every time you redo it, it's going to be different. Also, you're in a custom world, so everybody wants a different size. And when you take an eight-foot table and make it a ten-foot table, it's a dining table in some people's eyes. But no, you really have to ergonomic it. You got to figure out well, how big are your chairs? How big are your placements? How many people are you putting over here? And how many people are you putting over there? And it's, that's what's maniacal about it is. You'd love to have one-offs just baking and churning out the back door. 
but they just don't do it. Even the cast aluminum tables, you know, hey, it's a cast aluminum table. How, how much thinking do you need to put into the next one? They just change the size. Oh, where do you put the legs? Even on that, it, it's kind of crazy. And that's why you really need a good team. You need to train people who, <coughs> as a CEO or C, CNO, chief nut, <laughs> you don't want to be looking at dining room table drawings after 10 years and going, hey, Phil, you got to move the, you know, I can't, he's going to hit that leg, you know. Um, is there any part of it that scales up or does multiples in a real true way? I don't think there's a single thing in here. And then when you get into the architectural stuff, forget about it, you know, everything is different. And uh, I used to have a joke. I just want to make wabo jabos. You know, <laughs> here's the wabo jabo factory. And it's just the gift that keeps on giving. I didn't go there. So. Yeah. It seems like a lot of the design by this um, concept of reality and honesty and material versus this playful creative side. But the floating log sort of strikes me as based more on illusion and magic. Do you have a philosophical? Yeah, I did, actually. I did, because first of all, that really wasn't, a lot of times people collaborate with us, and where the center line of the collaboration is can go this way or this way. On that one, that center line of the collaboration was really more to the other side. And I actually found certain very disagreeable aspects of it. In the end, it photographs well, and it blew people away in real time. And that was great, um, but it actually was really kind of onerous to do that project because first of all, no one believed in it, in, in our ability to make it, which was kind of like, well, wait a minute, what are you coming to me for to put a log on a piece of glass if you don't think I can do it? That's almost a story. Um, <laughs> and then furthermore, how does this really mean anything? You know, it's so intellectual. Sukkah is a, it's a, Jewish holiday. I mean, somebody here probably knows this better than I. It's a harvest holiday, and it's about humility, and you build a shack. So there's rules to a sukkah structure, and it has to have the day and night light coming through a hole in the ceiling. It has to be made of wood. And, and there's, a, there's a very few preferences in that equation. And these fellows we collaborated with on it, they took them to the point of just such raw abstraction that, you know, it was cool, but it's kind of, it went in the dumpster in 48 hours. <laughs> so I think that's really adroit of you to notice that that probably, I put that at the end because it's like, wow, pop, you know, there's a pop, you know. But it really did stand out when you think about how it fits into the story, so thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.